exactly like a signature. And when you did that, it stopped the, the uh, Initial models were very expensive. When I saw the first one in the mall kiosk, it was about $200. The replacement cartridges were about $30 a piece. And you look at that as a pediatrician, you go, that's not for kids, that's way too expensive, right? It's gotta be cheaper than that if kids are gonna get all of it. So I looked at it the first time and didn't think it was a threat to what we were doing with youth tobacco prevention. But that changed over time. Again, they were marketed as harmless water vapor like steam, oh, you're just inhaling, you know, water vapor. Now look at that picture. Does that look like water vapor to you? Like in the coldest climate on the planet, when you exhale, it's not gonna hang in the air like this. So even their own marketing materials told you they were lying. But the general public doesn't know that. They hear water vapor and they think it's safe. And even the language we use now, when we say it's vaping and vape shops and all that stuff, comes from the fact that they use water vapor as a term in their marketing. And every time you say vaping, you're helping them make people think that it's harmless water vapor. These are chemical emissions like coming off that tailpipe of your car. And that's how you should think about it. Nothing about it is safe. The FDA saw these devices coming into the country and they decided to take a stand. In March of 2009, they actually decided they were going to halt the import of these products because it looked to them like it was a drug delivery device. And there's a pathway to be pre-approved by the FDA if you're a drug delivery device. If I'm a catheter or if I'm a, um, a needle that I'm going to use to inject somebody with a vaccine, that has to be pre-approved by the FDA, right? That's a medical device. So the FDA said, we're going to stop the import of these things from China now. Well, two companies weren't happy with that. One was smoking, every, uh, smoking Everywhere, which was the product I showed you. The other one was Soterra, which made a less expensive device and currently makes Enjoy, which is still available. They sued the FDA and they said, no, you don't have the right to regulate us. We're a tobacco product. Now, think about that claim because it's really important. They said in court, we are a tobacco product. Therefore, the FDA doesn't have the right to regulate us. In June of that same year, something really cool happened. The FDA got the authority to regulate tobacco with the passage of the Family uh, Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act of 2009. That was signed into law in June of 2009. That's in the middle of the court case. So follow along now. They went to court, said, you can't regulate us, we're a tobacco product. The federal government said, we can regulate tobacco products. And so in, December of 2010, a federal judge settled the case in favor of the electronic cigarette industry and said, you're right, the FDA can only regulate you as a tobacco product unless you make a health claim, unless you promise somebody that it helps them quit or has some other health benefit. In that case, you can regulate them as a medical device. So the electronic, the electronic cigarette industry got what they asked for in that court case. They asked for the right to be regulated as a tobacco product and exactly, that is exactly what they've got. It's really, really important to remember that the tobacco regulation is at the request of the vaping industry. In April of 2011, the FDA announced that they were gonna follow those rules. They were going to do exactly what the judge said. They're going to regulate e-cigarettes as a tobacco product unless they make a false health claim, in which case they will be regulated as a medical device, like nicotine patches, like nicotine gum, like other products that we use to help people actually quit smoking. Because the goal of those products is to change them over to those devices, like a nicotine patch, wean them off the nicotine, and at the end of the day, they are off nicotine. They are nicotine free. That's what quitting means. Quitting means you have overcome a nicotine addiction. Not that you've switched from a cigarette to an electronic cigarette. That doesn't count as quitting. That's like saying I've driven a car my entire life and today I bought a pickup truck. I don't get credit for quitting driving. I simply switched my vehicle. And that's all this is. It's a vehicle for delivering a highly addictive drug that has medical consequences. 
The problem we saw when we started seeing the issue with children was that as there was a bigger market share, cheaper models came onto the market. And the next wave of models were much more in a price range that kids might be able to afford. They were small, disposable units. They cost anywhere from $5.99 to $9.99 a piece. You used it till the nicotine was gone and you threw the whole device out, including the battery. And the biggest market, the biggest player in that share at the time was by the Enjoy, who by the way was one of the, it's made by Soterra and is one of the two plaintiffs in the FDA case. They captured one third of the market by making cheap products and selling them in convenience stores, which is exactly the place that children and teenagers shop. Another product at the same time, blue e-cigarettes, which was only notable because the light on the end of it was blue, they had another 25% of the market. So these two cheap disposable models came to the market and captured 60% of the e-cigarette market in roughly 2010, 2011. And at that point, it was becoming a threat to the traditional tobacco manufacturers, right? That's a big enough player to make a dent in their profits. And so in April 2012, Lorillard, which was the oldest tobacco company in the country, not the biggest, but the oldest, they made Newport cigarettes, which was the biggest selling menthol brand, especially among African-Americans, and a product called True, they bought Blue for $135 million in cash, just had it laying around, pocket change. They bought that company because they weren't sure that this was a threat to their business or was gonna be the next wave of business, but they wanted in. And rather than develop their own product, they bought an existing product that had 25% of the market share. That's when you knew it was big tobacco because big tobacco told us it was big tobacco. And as soon as they bought it, they went from a product that was, you know, something like this to marketing flavors. Now, why would they do that? Because the tobacco industry has always known that their primary audience, their primary market is teenagers, right? 85% between 12 and 17 start. And because of other marketing restrictions, the, the quickest way to, to capture kids is flavors. And we know that, and we've known it for a long time. You know this is marketed to kids because it's not just cherry. Most adults in the room understand what cherry is. It's the adjective, cherry crush. Cherry crush is not there for an adult. Cherry crush is there to appeal to kids. Because if it was just adults we're talking about, you could call it cherry, and all of us would know what it is. Then they started to change the shapes and the sizes of the devices. They went from traditional what looked like stick e-cigarettes to devices that you could refill with what other chemicals you wanted to put in them, to things that didn't look anything like a traditional cigarette so you could hide them in plain sight. Even electronic versions of cigars and pipes were created in this era. This was made, by the way, by Swisher International, which is based in Jacksonville. So even our Florida companies had a role in doing this. And then it just becomes Star Wars. Like the devices get weirder and weirder and weirder because who's gonna know what any of these things are? As a parent, as a teacher, as a law enforcement officer, as a flight attendant. Now you go, why are you saying it as a flight attendant? Because early on, you know, the use of these things were banned on airplanes, right? Can't use them on airplanes, mainly because the batteries explode and they didn't want an explosion in the cabin. So look at this device here. What does that look like? It's like an asthma inhaler, right? That is an electronic cigarette designed to look like an asthma inhaler. Why? Because if you pull that out on an airplane and use it, who knows what you're carrying? Looks exactly like a medical device. That's how deceitful the industry is. Anything to do to maintain your addiction, even in a place where you're not allowed to use it like an airplane. So what's in these things, right? We just said, They've been telling you it's harmless water vapor since pretty much they were invented. And that's not the case. Nicotine in itself is bad. And all, all these products essentially have nicotine in them. They may tell you it's 0% nicotine, but the only people testing it is them. They're putting a number on a box. There's no independent verification of that. So when these initial models were out, the, there were some studies by the FDA that just tested what was in the cartridges. They found that even within a brand, that what was in the cartridge was a different concentration of nicotine device to device, and that each time you inhaled it, you got a different load of nicotine depending on how much chemical was in the chamber. 
So there was no regulation of how much nicotine people were getting in these in this first wave of devices that we've been talking about here initially. Nicotine is bad enough just because it's addictive. It's one of the most addictive substances on the planet. It has no redeeming qualities. It doesn't do you any good. It functions initially as a stimulant, like a form of speed. But then when you get addicted to it, you get what we call a negative addiction. You have to use the drug to feel normal. And then when you're not using the drug, you feel lousy. That's what nicotine withdrawal symptoms are. And you have to use the drug to get back to normal. It doesn't give you a high. You just get a low when you're not using it. And that's why we call it a negative addiction. So the reason people are driven to do this so much is because once they're addicted to it, they always feel bad when they're not using it. It's not that they feel good when they're using it. They, they get back to their normal baseline when they're using the drug. And that's because of the way it affects your nervous system. E-cigarettes, like we said, contain varying amounts of nicotine. And though we know that nicotine replacement is less harmful when used in patches and gum, part of the reason we know it's less harmful is because people don't use it long term. Like we don't have long term studies on what it means to be on nicotine gum for 40 years, right? We only know what it means to be on nicotine gum for six to 12 months. And either they successfully got off it or they fell back to using tobacco or whatever it was. But nobody's just intent, like nobody's supposed to be sitting around using nicotine gum. And we know it happens. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but nobody's supposed to be running around using nicotine gum for 40 years. We don't have any long term data on it. But what we do know is that nicotine itself can cause uh, metabolites on it, can cause cancer. Most of those metabolites are created by heating, which is interesting. So if you heat the nicotine, you create some metabolites that are much more likely to cause cancer. It causes cardiovascular disease, which is the biggest problem. It causes increase in blood pressure, increase in heart rate, decrease oxygenation, all the things that would set you up for a heart attack or a stroke. It changes your, the coagulation in your blood. And all of those things set you up for bad heart attacks and bad strokes. So that's the really the number one problem associated with nicotine. And then poisoning. That's getting too much nicotine. It is a toxin. In fact, it's an organic pesticide. We use it to kill bugs. You know how those bugs die? They seize to death. They have seizures because it's a neurotoxin. So 10 milligrams of nicotine, 10 milligrams of nicotine would kill a toddler. 60 milligrams of nicotine will kill an adult if you got it all at once. Just wanted you to remember those numbers because I'm going to share some products with you later that have way in excess of those numbers that are incredibly dangerous. So those are the three big problems that we've seen with nicotine. This is the worst one for adults, cardiovascular disease and stroke. This is a really bad one with respect to our kids, and that problem's been made worse because of the availability of nicotine in electronic devices. So let's talk about the direct toxicity. As we started to see an increase in the sale of electronic cigarettes, we started to see a parallel increase in the number of calls to poison control centers with nicotine ingestion by kids. Here's why. If I had a pack of cigarettes in my hand, every cigarette in that pack has one to two milligrams of nicotine. So the entire pack of cigarettes contains 20 to 40 milligrams of nicotine. I'm a toddler. I pick up a cigarette and I chew on it. First of all, my maximum dose is one to two milligrams of nicotine, but I'm not gonna get that because it tastes lousy. No toddler is gonna to walk up and eat 10 cigarettes and get 10 milligrams of nicotine that would be directly toxic and cause a death. But in a capsule of nicotine that may have 30 milligrams of nicotine in it or 60 milligrams of nicotine in it, they can drink that down super quick and when you combine that with the fact that they're marketing them in flavors and boxes that look like children's products, I'm a toddler and I see something that's marketed that's literally called juice box that has 180 milligrams of three milligrams per mil nicotine, 180 milliliters of three milligrams per mil. That's 540 milligrams of nicotine in that vial. That's enough to kill 54 toddlers. That's enough to kill nine adults if you drank the whole bottle or if you drank uh, that bottle. That's why the poison control numbers went way up because it's so much easier to drink something that's flavored like apple that is a in a juice box looking thing. No wonder toddlers were picking this stuff up and ingesting it. So we've had an increase. We've had one death in Florida on the west coast of Florida as a result of this. Kids have died as a result of this. 
So the direct toxicity to our pediatric population is incredibly dangerous when we're going to say it's okay to have a product that looks like this on the market because this helps adults quit. That's the logic the industry is telling. You. They're saying, but we have to have flavored products because that's what allows an adult to quit. Listen, if it's so good that it's so much better for you than smoking, then it shouldn't matter what the flavor is, right? If we're going to do it on the merits, let's do it on the merits. Don't tell me you need apple in order to quit and have toddlers die as a result of your inability to be an adult. Other additives. So when you look at a chamber, the three most common chemicals that we find in there, propylene glycol probably makes up two thirds of the volume of any cartridge. We'll talk about what that is in a second. Glycerin, another food additive and medication additive makes up another 24% of the volume. So they're the two biggest chemicals that are in there. The other thing we want to touch on is the flavorings. They don't make up a lot in volume. They're not a big percentage of the volume. You don't need very much to change the flavor of something. But as far as the danger chemicals in there, they're a big player. And we'll talk about that in a second. So let's talk about propylene glycol, which is the biggest ingredient in there. Propylene glycol was a replacement. It had been a different chemical that was used in antifreeze, believe it or not. And when it was identified that this chemical was in there by the FDA in those original studies, the industry pulled that out of there and went with a similar chemical called propylene glycol. Propylene glycol is the chemical you put in a fog machine at the theater that makes the mist or the fog. <clears throat> it's, a, uh, it's a complex chemical. It's partly water soluble, it's partly uh, uh, oil based, which makes it interesting in why you get this kind of mist. Yes, the, the FDA has classified that chemical as, quote, generally recognized as safe on the basis of one study on rats and monkeys done in, yes, 1947. One study in 1947, this is generally recognized as safe. However, the major manufacturers of the product, all of them are on record as saying, you should avoid the mist. <laughs> there are the people who make the, the, the chemicals, they're the ones that be you know, subject to lawsuits if you if you misused it. So here, from our old friends at Dow Chemical, you never heard me say I have friends at Dow Chemical, but tonight I'll say our friends at Dow Chemical, even our friends at Dow Chemical don't think you should use their product to inhale. This is from their guide to glycols regarding vapor inhalation and eye exposure. And this is what they say in the paperwork on the chemical that everybody's using to inhale. Breathing spray mist of these materials should be avoided. In general, Dow does not support or recommend the use of Dow's glycols in applications where breathing or human eye contact with spray mists of these materials is likely, such as fogs and theatrical productions, antifreeze solutions for emergency eye wash. They're telling you, you shouldn't be doing this. Now, I know that's lawyers talking because they make this thing to go in fog machines, <laughs> right? And then they say, but you shouldn't use it in a fog machine. That's the primary thing for years that it had been sold. But now we have people putting it in a device that they're going to inhale repeatedly. We're not sitting at the theater and, you know, the Phantom of the Opera comes out for one scene and they put a mist in the theater and even that's kind of uncomfortable for some people. This is somebody inhaling it over and over and over again because the nicotine is driving them to do it repeatedly, right? That's not the same level of exposure as somebody standing on a theater stage for five minutes. What are some of the health risks associated with propylene glycol? Well, when the mists or fogs, we see throat irritation. None of these things should surprise you, right? This is a chemical irritant to your airways because even the company tells you you shouldn't inhale it. Uh, ocular irritation or eye irritation, cough and mild airway obstruction, which is asthma-like symptoms and airway obstruction, throat and vocal cord inflammation. So there are theater people who, you know, Actors' Equity has gone on record. They have rules in some of the union guidebooks that you know, if an actor's on stage and has a reaction to this, you gotta stop using it, right? Because somebody's gonna come out and sing, and if the mist is affecting their vocal cords and their performance, they gotta stop using the material on stage. Headache, dizziness, and drowsiness as a result, usually of respiratory problems. That's all kind of secondary to having a little bit of hypoxia, low levels of oxygen in your breathing. However, it is used in other medications, including oral medications and even IV medications. 
And so if it's used by mouth or IV, you can actually get systemic skin reaction. It's a big, bad allergic reaction. You can have kidney damage as a result of that. You can also have coma and uh, blood acidosis. The smaller the patient, the more likely that is to happen. So we see this a lot in young kids who are in the ICU setting. They're getting medications that have this in there to help as a solvent for an IV medication. One final point about this we've already touched on is the health complications were all identified in studies that looked at periodic exposure. I'm in a theater, I'm exposed. I'm at the hockey game and it's the pregame and they're blowing mist in front of people at the stadium. But nobody's ever looked at the deep inhalation of this product multiple times daily by somebody who's an e-cigarette smoker. These guys are part of, they have competitions now. There's a whole vaping subculture where they, they have these competitions to see who can blow the biggest clouds in the funkiest shapes of clouds, right? It's like the X Games of vaping, it's called. And they actually turn up the wattage in the devices to overheat the chemicals to make more mist. Nobody studied that. That's not safe. Give me a break. We know it's not going to be safe. And these guys are doing it on purpose. And so somebody who inhales this thing 20, 30, 40 times a day because of the drive to inhale it repeatedly because of the addiction is more likely going to have lung problems long term. Flavors I'm going to touch on briefly. There are about 7,000 flavored products that have been identified for sale in the United States. It's actually way more than that. Um, most of the chemical flavorings have been approved for ingestion. What do I mean by that? If you have a grape flavored popsicle, you're probably not having any grape in that popsicle, right? You have a chemical flavoring that tastes like grape. The FDA has approved those things to be eaten, right? So they looked at that and said it's safe to eat that chemical that tastes like grape. If I were you, I would just go with grapes, right? There's so much more wholesome nutrition in a grape than it would be in grape flavored vape juice. But these chemicals have never been approved for inhalation. So when we look at these things that have been quote unquote FDA approved, nobody's ever run that past the FDA on, well, what is a great flavored chemical gonna do to your lungs when you inhale it repeatedly over time? Remember, just because a chemical is safe to ingest doesn't mean it's safe to eat or uh, to uh, inhale. And the best chemical example that I can give you is water. Boy, oh boy, we'd love you guys to drink more water. We don't want you inhaling it. We call that drowning. We know that chemical doesn't belong in your lungs. These flavors do not belong in your lungs, and they are and will cause problems long term. The best example of that is a chemical called diacetyl. This was a butter flavor chemical that was used by the popcorn industry. Right, that powdery substance in those bags of popcorn you, you throw in your microwave primarily is a chemical in there called diacetyl. In England, where they were bagging some of this popcorn up, they had a wave of lung injuries in the workers. They all got horrific asthma and emphysema-like symptoms, which we call bronchiolitis obliterans. And it was determined it was because none of them were wearing masks where they were bagging the popcorn and they were being exposed to this diacetyl through inhalation. 75% of electronic cigarettes use diacetyl because the butter flavor is kind of a neutral flavor. If you're making an apple pie flavored vape, you're probably going to have cinnamon, apple, and butter. In it. It's a mix and match chemical. And so 75% of flavored, flavored e-cigarettes on the market use this particular chemical, which caused bronchiolitis obliterans in patients who are exposed to it at work. But now we're just going to inhale it over and over and over again in an untested environment and just see what happens. If I ran an experiment on my patients, just gave them a chemical, I'm sure what it was going to do, didn't tell them about it, uh, that'd be called malpractice. When the tobacco industry does it, it's called marketing. And I don't understand why they're allowed to get away with it. What are the other unexpected contaminants? These are things they went looking for because we know what's in a cigarette. So we wanted to look for these chemicals in an e-cigarette to determine whether the e-cigarettes were safer or not. Do these e-cigarettes have less or more of the same chemicals we find in a cigarette? So people studied this to death. Some of the things we found are other tobacco-specific nitrosamines. These are tobacco metabolites that are also carcinogenic. 
there was uh, chemicals like formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and acrolein that's found in cigarettes, also found in electronic cigarettes. I will tell you that formaldehyde metabolites are found in higher concentrations in these cigarettes than in traditional cigarettes, mostly because of the heating element. The hotter the wick burns in an e-cigarette, the more formaldehyde metabolites you make. So those guys from the X Games of vaping are embalming themselves slowly over time because they're making more formaldehyde because of the wattage in their device. And lastly, heavy metals. And many of the heavy metals are in higher concentrations in e-cigarettes. There's no surprise there. It's a metal tube that you're passing heat through. And so you're leaching out, leaching out some of the other chemicals. How about unexpected chemicals? Somebody finally thought in 2021 to go looking for other chemicals. These were researchers at Johns Hopkins University. They did two complex chemical fingerprinting studies, if you want to think of them that way. And they discovered that there are tons of other chemicals in these things that nobody bothered to look for before. Many hazardous chemicals that we don't see in traditional cigarettes are found in this new in this e-cigarette, both the chemicals in the cartridge and when you vaporize them. When you make it into a mist or a fog, of course you metabolize chemicals into a different way because of the heat. And so both of those things create, there's chemicals in the juice, and then there's chemicals, additional chemicals made by heating it. And there are many of those things in, like I said, the vaping liquid and aerosols, and many of these are carcinogenic. Carcinogenic chemicals. So when the e-cigarette industry says eh, nothing but water and flavors and nicotine, maybe, maybe there's nicotine in it. We tell you zero on some of the products. Uh, they're not to be believed. Trust but verify. What are the impact of the chemical emissions? You know, we had a pandemic recently. I don't know if anybody heard about this. Um, and it started about February of 2020. You know what would happen right before that? Right before that, we had an outbreak in the United States of a vaping-related lung damage. It ended up going by the acronym EVALI, E-V-A-L-I, Electronic Vaping, Electronic Vaping Associated Lung Injury, E-V-A-L-I. Don't worry about the acronym. It was lung damage caused by electronic cigarettes. By February 18th of 2020, that's a really important date, February 18th, 2020, that was the last date they reported data on this. <clears throat> there were a total of 2,807 patients hospitalized throughout the United States. And that was from all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and two U.S. territories, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Everybody reported. 68 people died in 29 different states in the District of Columbia. This was a major news story two years ago at this time. This was going on. When I did this talk two years ago, I had initial numbers. I didn't even have this data available to me, right? Because this was like in November, two years ago that I did this. Among patients who were hospitalized with it as of January, 66% were male, so it's primarily a, a, a disease of male patients. The median age was 24 years of age. It was a, an age of young, it was a disease of young people, but the range was from 13 to 85. Both of those numbers make me nervous because a 13 year old shouldn't have access to these products and an 85 year old, what's up with that? You, <laughs> I can't figure out the 85 year old hipster that bought an e-cigarette was a good idea. <laughs> By age group, 15% of the patients were under the age of 18. 15% of the patients were under age minors who had access to these products. Think about that. We had one guy in, in we had one death in Florida in a teenager. We also had one kid who I think was from Florida that needed a lung transplant mm -hmm. from Jacksonville area as a result of this. Both of, two of the 18 and under category. 37% of the patients were between 18 and 24, and 24% of the patients were 25 to 34. So if you look at that, it tells you that three quarters of the patients were under the age of 34. This was a disease of young people. 24, only 24% of the patients were older than 35. Of the people who were hospitalized that we had some sort of data on, some sort of substance use data, it was interesting because some of these people were using vaping devices that gave them THC or marijuana, right? So 82% of the patients reported using THC containing products, but, there, but only 33% reported exclusive use of, of pot versions of the of vaping devices. 
57% reported nicotine containing products and 14% were only using nicotine. So it's hard to parse out. We know it wasn't nicotine. We know it wasn't THC, right? There's a lot of crossover. So what was it? What was the commonality in these THC devices and these nicotine devices? And it looks like it was probably vitamin E acetate, which is used more in the THC industry than it is in the nicotine industry. But it was found in a lot of the samples tested by the FDA of patients who were hospitalized or who had died. And if you know anything about vitamin E, it's a vitamin, it's also an additive in a lot of these products, but it's supposed to be used in foods, vegetable oils, cereals, meats, fruits, vegetables. It's also available as a vitamin E dietary supplement, right? Vitamin E capsules. And it's also a lot of topical products. But like I said before, it doesn't cause any harm when it's an ingested. It's a vitamin. It's supposed to be ingested. And it's used topically. And it's been used topically for years. No side effects. But inhaling it, it's an oil-based vitamin. Probably not a good idea. And sure enough, it looks like that was the primary culprit in this. So what we saw that was interesting is that, you know, I was here in November two years ago. This is 2019 data going into 2020. It peaked in September that year, and it freaked kids out. Kids were coming up to me who were like, can you help me quit? I'm vaping. And, you know, they, they were hearing the message that people were getting sick and dying from this thing, including their peers, you know, young people. And so it peaked in September, and then it started to fade away. And it had kind of, we think, burned itself out by February. And the CDC is not even tracking it anymore. You know why? Because we have another problem. It causes a, the exact same symptoms. And it's called COVID-19. And so now, in order to get the diagnosis of Yavali, you have to have negative COVID tests. So we don't know how many patients are going to the hospital that had some lung-related damage from an e-cigarette. Because if you go in and test positive for COVID-19, you're a COVID-19 patient. But we know that these kinds of chemicals, both in traditional cigarettes and in e-cigarettes, cause enough lung damage to make you more susceptible to viruses. Think about my kids that I took care of years ago in North Carolina who were just secondhand smoke exposure from their parents and had increased respiratory illnesses, increased viral infections, increased ear infections, all as a result of smoke exposure. So we don't know what part some of the vaping has played in cases of COVID-19. It may set you up for infection. It may be a risk factor for COVID-19. Then if you go in with COVID-19, nobody's gonna say Ebola because in order to be diagnosed as Ebola, you have to have nothing else but the e-cigarette use. Right? Everything else has to be negative. If you test positive for influenza, they're going to blame influenza. Test positive for COVID, they're going to blame COVID. Ebola, you had to be negative for everything else and be an e-cigarette user and have this telltale lung exit. So again, this is, this is kind of cover what I just said about the COVID-19 cases. So on top of that background, we saw an increase in fringe brands, not your big players, but other brands trying to reach out and grab kids. And in order to get the attention of kids, they got to be more and more extreme. So one of the things we saw were products that were designed more with packaging and fonts and colors and flavors that were more appealing to kids. This is nothing more than a traditional sticky cigarette, like Enjoy or any of the other things I showed you. But again, look at the adjectives. It's not just peach, it's juicy peach. It's not just vanilla, it's very vanilla. Use of adjectives tells you the target market and the use of something called Crave tells you the target market. This is not something an adult's gonna go into the store and go, I think crave very vanilla for me today. That's not going to happen, right? It's not going to happen. And then when hookah was a bit of a fad briefly in the 2012-2013 era, a lot of the other brands played on that and called what we, we had this wave of what we call hookah pants. First hookah pen I bought, I bought here in town over by Vero Beach High School when I was going to do a presentation. I stopped in the store to get a cup of coffee and I saw one of these disposable imperial pens and I bought it, which I tended to do so I could go into class and go, Look what I bought just up the road. And the problem with those, we even heard reports in that era about these being in backpacks and they look like magic markers and teachers don't know. And kids were using them in classrooms behind the teacher's back. And I'm talking about 2012, right? Then we got into the thing where the models looked more bizarre and the tanks were refillable. You could fill these up with whatever you wanted, hence the use of THC products in some of these devices. And so we started to see waves of flavors that were appealing to kids like bubble gum, and also gummy candy. So again, I, I ask you, is gummy candy there to appeal to kids or is that to help an adult who's really motivated to quit, quit? 
I, you know, I wouldn't otherwise quit, except gummy candies are available. That's, that's nonsense. We know that's nonsense. Which takes me to the rise and fall of Juul, right? How many people here are familiar with Juul? Anybody? So 27, 2016, December 2016, they go into a classroom in Martin County to do a presentation. And a young girl asks me, what do you know about Jewel? And I said, the singer? <laughs> I had no clue what she was talking about. She goes, no, the, that thing that all the kids are using. No idea what she was talking about. Within weeks, early in 2017, we started to hear reports of this device. And it became the rage for kids. It was the number one selling e-cigarette brand in the United States on the backs of our kids. On the backs of our kids in 2018, 2017, 2018, heading into 2019, to be honest with you. And why was that? Because it was, looked like a flash drive, another hidden in plain sight kind of device, right? It came boxed almost like an iPhone. It had a hip little USB charger that you could put on your computer. When you plugged it in your computer, it looked like one of those old Wi-Fi antennas. Some of the older folks in the audience remember when you used to plug in a Wi-Fi antenna in your computer. It had flavor pods, including mango and cool cucumber, because it can't just be cucumber, right? We got to get the kids. Cool mint. Can't just be mint, right? And, you know, it was, a, it was a gadget. It became hip because it was a gadget. It was another piece of tech, right? So it became very popular with kids for all those reasons. It was discreet. It was easy to hide. It was easy to use at school. It looked great in your backpack because it looked like a flash drive. Um, it came in all those fun flavors. And then the other thing the kids would describe was this interesting thing where they say, it gives you a good buzz or a head rush. Everybody talks about nicotine, not really supposed to do that, is it? You know, it's a negative addiction. So we, people studied what that was. And what they had done was they had patented a new form of nicotine, a nicotine salt that mimicked more closely the way nicotine gets to your brain if you inhale a cigarette. Problem with the, what makes nicotine so addictive is you inhale it and it's in your brain in like five to 10 seconds. And that one, two punch, that instant thing is what makes it so addictive. Well, the original e-cigarettes weren't quite that addictive. They had a more slow burn. It didn't rise as high in your bloodstream as quickly. It didn't get to your brain as quickly. It kind of functioned more the way spit tobacco does. It was kind of a slow uh, increase. But Juul mimicked a real cigarette because of the chemical they used, it got to your brain faster. It impacted your brain more quickly. And the kids described that. The other reason they described it was because these are the most highly concentrated nicotine pods available. Each pod, each of those little pods, I should, contains 40 milligrams of nicotine. How many toddlers does that kill? Four. Each pod could kill four toddlers, 60 milligrams per mil, and the pod only holds 0.7 mils, or 40 milligrams a minute. Each adds equivalent to one to two packs of cigarettes a day. Each pod, one to two packs of cigarettes a day. How many were kids going through? See, the other problem with an e-cigarette is you don't know the end point. You know, when people smoke a cigarette, right, they light it up, and they take a few drags, they get their nicotine hit, maybe they finish it, but at some point it's done. It's only so long. E-cigarettes are like that. You just put it in your mouth, you put it in your mouth, you put it in your mouth, and there is no end point. So kids are blowing through a couple of these a day, which is the equivalent of two to four packs of cigarettes a day. Because, you know, it's cool cucumber. Why not? So, the FDA, that was an overreach. The, the, the bad news was it addicted a bunch of kids. The good news was it woke the FDA up. They were like, this is bad. Yeah, we know. We've been, we've been telling you it's been bad for a while. But they started to crank down, particularly on their target was Juul, but they finally realized they really had to do some work on electronic cigarettes. So they started taking an aggressive plan against particularly flavor products that targeted kids. So in January 2020, they announced that they were going to take action to remove most unauthorized flavored e-cigarette cartridges from the market. Their target there was Juul, e-cigarette cartridges, right? Those little things I just showed you is a cartridge. 
The tank systems aren't cartridges, right? If you've got a big bottle like that apple juice thing I showed you before that you can squirt into a container, that's not a cartridge. If it's a disposable model, that's not a cartridge. It applied to all flavors except menthol because there's no ban on menthol cigarettes. Currently. So they use that as the benchmark. So menthol is not touchable. On the market. So they removed all the flavors off of menthol. And again, it only applied to the cartridges and not the tank systems or disposables. So while this was all a rage until that announcement, this has become the rage now. This is our friends at Puff. Puff Bar is the new jewel. Puff Bar is a disposable product. Some have a quote unquote cartridge, so they can have all the flavors they want. This is your number one selling brand of e-cigarettes now among your kids. It's a jewel that's disposable. But because of the way the FDA rule was, they are using this instead of that. So what's the FDA say about that? Well, in July, they notified several companies, including Popcorn, that they had to remove their flavored disposable e-cigarettes from the market. All right, that was a response. Okay, you loophole this. So now we're going to say you have to remove these from the market. What did they say? In March of 2021, you can see the court system's really on the wall, right? Puff Bar defied the FDA by making the following claim. Their nicotine-based products are crafted from a patented manufacturing process, not from tobacco. What is the argument they're making there? We're not a tobacco shop. Remember, they went to court to say they were. Now they're making the argument, we're not. So what do we need to ask the FDA to do? Hold them to the other pathway. If they're not a tobacco product, they're a medical delivery device. They need to be held accountable and go through that pathway, just like patches and just like gum, and prove that there's some medical benefit. Otherwise, these things should be pulled from the market, period. So I'm hoping that this will prompt the FDA to finally take that kind of action because they've never taken that action on an e-cigarette, despite the fact that many, many, many e-cigarette companies have been making claims that it helps people quit. Not switch, quit. So the FDA needs to take that action in accordance with the lawsuit because now these guys have violated the spirit of the lawsuit. In the meantime, this past August, the FDA issued marketing denial orders for 55,000 different flavored e-cigarette products after determining that those products lack sufficient evidence that they have a benefit to adult smokers. That means it doesn't help anybody quit. And there's no advantage to having flavors in it. So they they had to apply. If you had a, a dead, the date was when they got control of e-cigarettes finally was August of 2016. So if you were on the market before August 16, August of 2016, you had to submit an application to stay on the market. Those applications were due a year ago, and they've basically denied these 55,000 products. They're like, no, this isn't going to cut. They also stated at the time that they that they dealt with 98% of the applications that were submitted by the deadline, which means they haven't dealt with about 2% of them. And unfortunately, the 2% they haven't dealt with are the big players. They haven't dealt with Jewel. They haven't dealt with Puff Bar. They haven't dealt with um, uh, some of the big players like the Marlboro product. But what they have, and by the way, that 98% includes issuing marketing denial orders for more than a million flavored ends products that lack sufficient evidence that the benefit of adult smokers who use a flavor products would overcome the public health concern posed by well-documented and considerable appeal to products to youth. So the point they were making there was we denied millions of applications because we realized it was more of a threat to kids than it was a help to adults. So you don't get to have uh, you know, gummy candy flavor that doesn't help adults as much as it harms kids. So that's important action. However, the other thing they did that's very nerve wracking is that just a week ago, they actually authorized three electronic, three ends products, three cigarette products, the Views Solo Power Unit and two tobacco flavored replacement products. This is the first product they've authorized and said it's okay to sell in the United States. It's not FDA approval. Uh, it's not FDA uh, endorsement of the product. It just says it's okay to do that. It is tobacco flavored. It's not a flavor. And so they denied 10 additional flavors that they submitted. And they, um, 
have not ruled on their menthol product yet because menthol is in kind of a regulatory gray zone right now. We don't have time to really get into that, but they did deny all their other flavors. They said you can sell tobacco fruit, but you can't sell any other candy or fruit flavors and menthol they haven't dealt with. The other piece of legislation that's important to know is that in December of 2019, the age for tobacco sales and purchase in the United States was raised to 21. That's a national standard. Federal uh, enforcement of that is underway in Florida. However, in Florida, and it just took effect in October, 20, oh, October 1st, the age was raised to 21 in Florida, but they put a bunch of other industry friendly language in the bill to make enforcement of that very difficult in the state of Florida. And so it's good that it's raised, but it's bad that they're not looking over anybody's shoulder as much as they should. So while I'm glad the age is 21 now, both nationally and in Florida, I wish we would enforce it better because otherwise kids are still gonna get on. Last thing I'll share with you and then we'll wrap it up. This is the data on tobacco use in Florida going back to 1998. This is the middle school data. And just to walk you through it really quickly, this is cigarette use, this is cigar use, this is spit tobacco use. That was what was available in 1998, right? And we worked really hard in tobacco prevention to reduce the use of those products among our kids. All of those are less than 2% of middle school students. At this point. Historically low numbers. Middle school students smoked at about an 18 and a half percent rate when this project was started, and now we're below 2%. But look at the blue line, that's these cigarettes. Look what's happened since they made it to, to the youth market in 2011. That's when we started tracking it. We saw a sharp increase through about 2016. We worked hard to try to turn the corner. We did, and then Juul was introduced. Literally, Juul was introduced, and we saw that happen. And then the pandemic happened and Ibali happened and we had this downturn that we measured in 2020. I hope that's a trend that we see that continues to go down. I can't promise you that. I don't know what the impact of separating kids away from each other so that peer-to-peer -peer sharing on campuses wasn't happening or what Ibali's impact was on kids using it like they got freaked out because people were getting sick. Regardless of that, we hope that downward trend continues. I think some of this federal action will help us with that. I'll show you the high school data is the same story with higher numbers. So I don't need to walk through the whole thing, but you know, 27 and a half percent of high school students smoked cigarettes back in 1998, and that's less than 5% now. That's amazing. But in the same period of time, we had e-cigarettes go all the way up as high as 25% which was the same number that smoked cigarettes in 1999. That's 20 years of tobacco prevention down the drain if 25% of our high school students were addicted to nicotine as a result of an electronic device. Remember, this is not a tobacco problem, it's a nicotine addiction problem. And the younger you start, the more likely you are to be addicted, the more likely you are to have brain changes as a result of that chemical interaction, and the more likely you are to be addicted for life. And so if we get people past their early 20s, they're probably not gonna to decide to do this. And even if they do, the impact would be less. So this is really something we need to change the trajectory of in young, young people, particularly between the ages of 12 and 18. And so that's the group we really need to target. And I think that's the last slide I have. So I have some time, well, I have, wow, 90 seconds for questions. <laughs> I'm here, listen, I drove two hours to get here. I could stay 10 extra minutes and answer questions. So happy to take any questions. And uh, if there's any from the chat, Kylie, if you see anything in there, let me know. Anybody? Overwhelmed? Yes, sir. They still have to have the warning label. The e-cigarette warning label was added, um, I think in 2016, when they first got the right to authorize e-cigarettes. And But all that really says is this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive substance. There's not much of a warning on the chemicals or the other components of the e-cigarettes, some of the chemicals we talked about on here. It's specifically a nicotine warning that's on those products. I'm hoping the FDA will go back and address that now that they know some of the other chemical components of these things, because if they reviewed the application, it's supposed to list all the chemicals that are in there. And so my hope is that over time, there'll be different kinds of warning labels, but you are absolutely correct. They still do need to have the warning label, the FDA warning label uh, that was put on it back in the, um, yeah, but probably four or five years ago. But I will tell you that the minute the FDA says it's okay to sell the views, whatever is Power Pro, whatever, 
the company goes out and crows, we've been, we've got FDA, you know, like endorsement, not approval, but endorsement. So the FDA was very careful to say, you know, we still don't think this is good for you, but we think that the value to adults of this product outweighs our concerns for kids because they're betting that most kids aren't going to go get this one product that has tobacco flavor as opposed to the candy flavors of the fruit flavor. So they're kind of they're they're trying to look for the best public health approach to this, and they are in a bit of a quandary because there is over time probably going to be a lower cancer risk with respect to e-cigarettes. It won't be zero, but it'll be less than cigarettes. And so is that a benefit to adults? Well, we'll know in 30 or 40 years, right? I can't answer that today. I won't know those exact numbers till people start getting sick. So they're hedging to say, we think there may be a benefit to adults who use this instead of cigarettes. But if a product's clearly going to increase the number of kids who do it by five or tenfold, we can't have that on the market. That's the bet they're hedging. You know, you're pretty careful to say, like, it's authorized about foods. Do you feel that people might not make that differentiation? Of course they won't. Just sort of the way they, they hear vape and they, they don't make the connection that it's not water vapor. Right, if you use language enough, right, the, the people who want it, they'll hear partly what they want to hear. Oh, the FDA said this is okay. That's what they're going to hear. The FDA didn't say it was safe, right? They, they, they were very careful to parse their words of what this meant that we were going to allow the sale of this product in the United States, this one particular product and these two cartridges. Um, but people are going to hear, oh, they said it was okay. Now, if you're talking about an adult smoker, reducing from two packs a day to an electronic device and maybe reducing the cancer risk. Remember, they're not going to reduce their heart attack risks. It's nicotine. In fact, if they use it the way some of these people are using it, that's going to go up. But again, those statistics aren't going to be available for a very long time. So that may have to be readdressed as more data becomes available. Um, and, it, and it will be. But you're absolutely right. They parse their words very carefully, but people are going to hear what they want to hear. Correct. Remember, the FDA already regulates all cigarettes, which means if they're for sale in the United States, the FDA said that's okay too. But we know cigarettes aren't. Remember, the reason cigarettes and tobacco are regulated differently by the FDA than a drug is exactly this reason, right? It's an addictive drug. It's like a legalized drug that had no regulation. And even when there were, there's a discussion about whether the FDA should weigh in on this, there were some people in public health that the FDA should absolutely not be involved in this because it looks like it's the stamp of approval. They were fearful of that when this conversation came up in 2009. But I got to believe that regulating it is better than not regulating it. And that more good will come from that than harm long term. So I was in favor of it then. I'm in favor of it now. I think they're moving slower than they should be. But the steps they're taking are in the right direction. It's been incremental at best. Like the flavored e-cigarettes should be off the market, period, full stop. Menthol cigarettes should be off the market, period, full stop. You want to be a smoker, smoke. I'm sorry if it tastes like tobacco, that's part of it. You know what I mean? Like, grow up. You want to do this deadly, horrible thing, do it. But don't then ask for something in it to make it easier for you, but then also be make it a target for kids. Be an adult. You know, you want to do this, do it. The problem is most of these people started when they were 13. They think they're doing it because they're a big, bad adult, but they all started when they were 13. They're addicted to it and they're trying to justify that in their head. So remember, most of these people started as teenagers. And that's the, the critical thing. We got to break that cycle. We got to get a population of kids who don't do it because then we won't have adults do it. It'll just disappear. That's what the industry doesn't want. And that's why they target young people. Because I'm not going to get in the car tonight, drive home, stop to get a bottle of water and some gas and look at the rack and go, you know, today's the day. Give me a pack of Marlboros. I'm 59. Let's do it up. Like, that's not going to happen. Like, I made the decision not to do this when I was 15 years old. And I still remember the day, you know, that I said no. And my best friend at the time said yes. And he's still horribly addicted to it. And I'm not. From one decision behind a garage in 1977. Did I say that year out loud? <laughs> Anybody remember the 70s? Yeah. I see we have a question from chat. Can you speak to the reason why menthol flavor was left out of legislation and is the exception for menthol in the law and opening for allowing advertisement of flavorings? So uh, the menthol 
uh, exemption in the original FDA rules. There was some discussion about, so in the, uh, the way the law was written, it was signed into law on June. Three months after it was signed into law, all flavored cigarettes were pulled from the market with the exception of menthol. And that was a hot button topic in Congress. 85% of African-Americans smoke menthol. So the concern was, and I'm not, I'm not lying when I say this, that if they pulled, there were people making a claim, if they pull menthol from cigarettes, there's gonna be riots in the street. Can you hear what I'm talking about? Like this was the logic. So the Congressional Black Caucus was like, what are you talking about? You gotta pull menthol. That's targeting African-Americans specifically, 85% of African-Americans smoke menthol cigarettes. Other minority groups, it's about 50-50, and among whites, it's only thir a third or less than a third who use menthol cigarettes. It it's clearly was for minority uh, populations, but it got left in. So it's been there ever since. All flavors are still in cigars, but that having a menthol exemption didn't change the marketing of any of these products. What changed for e-cigarettes was nobody accounted for e-cigarettes. This was in 2009, remember, E-cigarettes just do whatever they want because they are trying to not, they're trying to beat tobacco and not beat tobacco and all this kind of stuff. So who rules the regulations on advertising? It's the Federal Trade Commission, not the FDA. The FDA could say, pull the flavors. The Federal Trade Commission has to say, no e-cigarette advertising on TV. Does that make sense? So the problem we face is that E-cigarettes just kind of did what they want, and there's been no real good sort of pushback from the Federal Trade Commission on advertising. But that doesn't have anything to do with the menthol ban. That has to do with this weird regulatory gray area that e-cigarettes fell into. Now, as far as menthol, last April, the FDA went on record and said, in one year, we're going to issue our ruling on banning menthol and all flavors from cigars, including menthol. So by April of this year, we are probably going to have a rule that says it's all gone. That does nothing for e-cigarettes. It's cigars and menthol and cigarettes. Guess who's fighting in opposition to that? One of the biggest uh, groups is Reverend Al Sharpton. And I find this very interesting because he thinks that if we pull menthol, it's a form of discrimination. And here's his argument, and I'll give some validity to this. He's worried that, all right, so you pull menthol from the market. Now, all of a sudden, the menthol, the people who use menthol, 85% of African-Americans, they're buying it on say a black market. Now they're being targeted by law enforcement because they're carrying menthol cigarettes. And he used the Eric Garner case as his logic. So Eric Garner, for those of you who don't remember, 2014, he was selling Lucy's in Brooklyn. Lucy's are when you buy a pack of cigarettes, you break it up into one or two and you sell them on the cheap out on the street. Stores did it too. Stores would package them like that for teenagers to come in and for 50 cents, get two cigarettes, right? So the FDA banned the sale of Lucy's, federal law. So stores couldn't sell Lucy's. They couldn't break up packs of cigarettes. Yandel cigarettes had to be sold in packs of 20. So Eric Garner bought a pack of cigarettes in the store and then he was out on the street breaking it up and selling. So they targeted him for selling Lucy's. Now remember, he's selling Lucy's. The rules are all on the sale of the product, not the use of product. If you have a menthol cigarette after the ban, you're not going to get arrested for smoking a menthol cigarette. What they want to target is who's making the illegal menthol cigarettes, who's selling the illegal menthol cigarettes. So while I understand Al Sharpton's point, I disagree with it. Um, I think it's discrimination to not take menthol off the market because we're saying we're going to sacrifice this population of people because they primarily will smoke menthol cigarettes. They started because of that, they continued to do it because of that. And by the way, there is a youth market for menthol cigarettes. So the, the long answer, which I just gave is, <laughs> it didn't impact advertising, but hopefully in the next six to eight months, we're gonna have rules to ban menthol and other flavored cigars, all flavored cigars from the marketplace. And then we will only have to start worrying about these cigarettes. And remember, we beat down cigars and cigarettes to the point where it's not really a threat among our youth anyway. But it would be good to get them off the market because it certainly doesn't help. There's a follow-up question, and I kind of already answered it, but do you know of any studies if they break down other flavor usage for communities of color? 
Uh, there's not a lot of data on other flavors specifically, except for menthol. The most of the data that exists now is more on the percentage of youth versus the percentages of adults that use flavored products across the board, and they don't really make a distinction. And the younger the age group, the higher the percentage that use flavored products. That's a that's a no brainer. Uh, so as you get into older and older populations, fewer and fewer people use flavored products. Menthol would be the exception. Uh, because it's been around so long and because it's in some of the more popular brands of cigarettes. Sure. Uh, so you mentioned that out of all the applications that were submitted before the deadline, the FDA has not yet ruled on 2% of them. About 2%. And they're the big dogs. What's your speculation as to why they haven't ruled on those 2%? I think because they're the, probably the products with the biggest market share and there's going to be the biggest shakedown when they say this. So if they come out and they go, Jewel, you're done. Uh, that's a huge thing to say. And that's, there's going to be a ton of discussion around that. So I think they did, like when I tackle a project, I do the easiest stuff first, save the, the hardest for last, because I feel like I'm making more progress. They got 98% of their work done. Yeah, <laughs> but they got the tough calls to make now. And I think that's why they're waiting on it. So they have to deal with the Marlboro, the, the Altria Philip Mars products. They have to deal with Juul. They have to really come to some consensus about Puff Bar. Uh, and Joy is on that list, which is the product that we were talking about from Soterra. So the big players are still there and probably had the more complete and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Polished applications, right? Because they had money to do it. It's not cheap to file these applications. And so they probably have a lot there to digest. That's probably why they felt obligated to authorize the sale of a tobacco flavored stick e-cigarette made by R.J. Reynolds. There's they probably didn't have much of a reason not to. I think what's going to happen at the end of the day, there's going to be like five products left on the market. They're all going to taste like tobacco. That's what I think they're aiming for. And the last thing I will say, which I didn't talk about before, is the FDA has the right to regulate the amount of nicotine in these products as well. They haven't even approached that pathway yet. Joe Biden floated that as an idea. You could reduce it to below addictive levels if you're the FDA. They cannot zero it out. That's the only rule. There has to be some nicotine in these tobacco products. But they can make it below um, addictive levels. And if it's below addictive levels, nobody's going to inhale smoke. It's a dumb thing to do. The rest of us walk away from it. If you're at a campfire and you're roasting a hot dog and the wind changes direction, blows smoke in your face, you don't go, ah, man, this is great. <laughs> Bring it on, right? You get out of the way. So this is a horrible thing to do. Your body knows to reject it, but you're driven by nicotine addiction. If you can reduce the nicotine to below addictive levels, nobody's going to inhale smoke. It's an uncomfortable situation at best. So that's another pathway they haven't even explored yet. Yes, sir. Fine. As you mentioned earlier, there's no like cutoff, you know, like well, how much did I smoke right. one single right. I, I guess my question is, is there even data to support the idea that these things actually help people quit? There's not much data to support that they lead to abstinence from nicotine. There's a lot of data to support that people move from smoking exclusively to vaping exclusively. And then the question is that is that less harmful than smoking? Right, that's what they, so that's what the industry uses as their evidence that they're helping. But the evidence that we use really is abstinence. So your question about weaning is an interesting one because if I make you lower the amount of nicotine in a vaping place, you'll just, if I cut it to one third the level, you'll inhale three times. You'll make up the dose by just using more, right? Especially with an e-cigarette where there's no end point. Like you would know that in a cigarette, like, man, I'm going through these things fast, but you wouldn't from an e-cigarette. So this idea of can we wean people off of these cigarettes by lowering the concentration of nicotine like we do with a patch of gum is an interesting one. I think it needs to be studied. Listen, if I had an e-cigarette that I could give to somebody and say, we're going to use this one for two weeks, we're going to use this one for two weeks, we're going to use this one for two weeks, then you're going to be done because I went from full nicotine to two-thirds to one-third to off, I would do that tomorrow. Show me the e-cigarette that does that. You can't find one right now because nobody wants to sell a product that at the end of the day, you're done buying. They're not interested in that. They need you to buy it forever in order to make a profit. There was a cigarette years ago called Quest did exactly this. 
it had different levels of nicotine in it. And they were numbered three, two, one, zero. And it worked. People quit. And Quest went out of business. <laughs> right? It worked too well. Nobody was smoking anymore. So Quest didn't survive as a company for that exact reason. So people who are selling a product to taper to abstinence, like a drug company, it's got a whole bunch of things in their portfolio, other medications, and they do this to help you wean, versus a company that's trying to make profit selling nicotine, that's two competing businesses. So they're never gonna, they're never gonna be able to, to address the standard of, we wanna be absent from nicotine at the end of the day. They'll never be able to do it. But if somebody would step up and do that, I would use that as a strategy in a heart. It's just harder when you when when the measurement when you can access it without seeing it like it's easy yeah. for a cigarette to, so one of the strategies we use when we help people quit would, is exactly that capture cigarettes you know if you smoke 20 a day tomorrow smoke 19. Right. do that for two days then smoke 18. That sounds more effective. it is more effective that's what i'm saying an e-cigarette doesn't help with that <laughs> you can do that better with a cigarette count than you can with a nicotine product. so anybody else great questions Hope you guys got something out of that. I know there's a lot of information there, you know, maybe too much science sometimes, but I hope you got something out of that and I look forward to coming back, I guess, next fall because I'm here roughly once a week. Thank you, Dr. Hummel, for coming back. Thank you, Dr. Hummel, for coming out and being here to all that came in person and attended via Zoom. I'm glad we could all attend. This will be available on recording, I believe, on our Facebook page in a little bit. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, we do have our tobacco free partnership meeting. We do meet the first Tuesday of the month at three o'clock at the Substance Awareness Center or via Zoom. So we will be still tackling the vaping issue. So, yeah, always looking for new members. Thank you.